welcome. Uh, um, yeah, at this point, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, may I ask Michelle to have the honors to introduce our speaker just in a couple of words, and then okay. And talk. It, it is a great much. pleasure for me uh, to present to present uh, Vincent Chalifour a second year PhD student at the, mat at the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at the UDN under my supervision. He get a master degree in, at UQTER at the, mathematical, at, at the Department of Mathematics and Informatics in 2019. He's a recipient of NSERC uh, Graham Bell Fellowship. And the title of his talk, uh, General Solution of the Exceptional Hermit Differential Equation and its Minimal Surfaces Representation. Welcome. Vincent? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Grandland. I will uh, start the fusion with the iPad. Just a second for that. Okay, so everyone sees uh, the PowerPoint, the Beamer right here. Okay, so uh, this is my first presentation uh, as a PhD student. Uh, as uh, Mr. Vichek said and Mr. Balog, there will be a, a period of question at the end. And I would appreciate if you ask the question during this period. And so uh, here are the two main objectives of our study. So the first one uh, is to construct the general solution of the exceptional Hermit differential equation. And to achieve that, we will talk about and define the exceptional Hermit orthogonal polynomials. We will also derive an ODE from a known differential operator. And we will use series representation to build the general solution of this equation. The second main objective is to construct a minimal surface representation of this solution, the general solution that we built. And to achieve that, we will make use of a link between the linear system for the moving frame on the surface and the classical nfr vh test representation for the immersion of a minimal surface in the 3D Euclidean space. And so at the end, if we have time, uh, I will show you some images, uh, very interesting images of these surfaces. And so as a starting point, let's consider equation one, which is a Stormyville problem involving a Schrodinger operator, L. And this operator possesses a potential U. And we know that if this operator is without monodromy, well, the potential will be of the form tree, which is written in terms of the Vronskian of classical Hermit polynomials subscripted by K1 to KL, which in this context will be a strictly increasing sequence. And so we see that the, 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 the singularities of the potential U correspond to the zeros of this Vronskin. So we need a result assuring us that there will be no zero on the real line. And here is a result about that. Theorem one called the Klein-Adler theorem. So let's consider equation five. We have right here a eigenvalue, eigenfunctions problem. The solutions, we consider the solutions phi j. And so theorem, the Klein-Adler theorem says that the Vronskian of these eigenfunctions from K1 to KL will have no zero on the real line if and only if our strictly increasing sequence of subscript has a certain structure. So if we consider this sequence right here, we will rename it as a new sequence. And this new sequence will take the form six. Now we have three constraints on the structure of the sequence. The first one is that we will divide our sequence by blocks. So the first block, must be a sequence of consecutive positive integers starting with zero of arbitrary length. But this block may be present or absent. Now the other blocks 
from one to S must be composed of an even number of terms. And the last constraint is that between two blocks, we must have a gap greater than one. Meaning that if I make the difference between, let's say, this integer and this one, it must be greater than one. And so if, if our sequence right here has this structure, well, we know that the Vronskian of our, our eigenfunctions will have no zero on the real line. And we will use this result uh, in a moment. And now let's define our exceptional polynomials. The first thing we need to do is take a partition. We will call it lambda. It'll be a non-decreasing sequence of positive integers. And if I make the sum of all the elements in the partition right here, I obtain a positive integer m. And so we will say that lambda is a partition of m, like in combinatorics. And from the initial partition, we define a double partition by duplicating each term of the partition. We will denote this double partition by lambda squared. And we see that we repeat the terms, lambda 1, lambda 1, 2, lambda L, lambda L. Now from this double partition, we will define a strictly increasing sequence by applying to our double partition this relation. The new strictly increasing sequence will be called Ki. It's simply the element plus its position minus 1. And the resulting strictly increasing sequence that we will call k will have this structure. And when we take a closer look, we see that the sequence 11 respects the structure of the kind adler theorem, implying that this Vronskian has no zero on the real line. And that will be very useful. Uh, OK, so here is the first definition. Definition one, the gap sequence will be denoted by k tilde. Um, it is all the positive integers that respects this constraint or this constraint. And so the first one is that n plus two times the length of the partition minus two times the integer that we are partitioning is negative. The other constraint is that the same expression is in K, our strictly increasing sequence. Okay, so this is the definition of our gap sequence. So let's make an example. Let's consider a simple partition, lambda equals one. We have only one element, it's one. And so if I make the sum of the elements, we see that lambda is a partition of M equals one. And so if I duplicate each term, I obtain the double partition, one, one. And applying the relation to find my strictly increasing sequence, we will obtain k1, k2, which are simply one and two. Now, since in this context, the length of the partition is one, and the integer that we partition is m equals one, so m equals l, meaning that our um, gap sequence will reduce to this sequence. It's all the positive integers that are negative, which is impossible, or that are in k. So in this case, our gap sequence will correspond to k, and it'll be strictly one, two. So we have a gap sequence, just an example. Before you move on, let me just point out that John John has a question. So uh, okay. you let, let him. Uh... Yes, John. Yeah, it's 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 actually just a trivial comment. You you're using partitions, and you're using I mean you're using things which are quite commonly used in combinatorics uh, and uh, and in integrable systems. But you're using reverse conventions. I was wondering why the lambdas usually are weakly decreasing, and the other things are also strongly decreasing. You're doing exactly the opposite. Is there any reason? Uh, no, uh, I'm using um, I, I'm using the 
the definition of uh, the exceptional Hermit polynomials that is in the literature? I'm talking about partitions. Partitions are weakly, usually weakly decreasing, not increasing. Okay, no, there's no reason. I'm, I'm strictly uh, using the results that are known to define these polynomials. And with this definition, we are considering all the possible families of Hermit polynomials. So you're talking about this right here? It's just a question of convention. You're using a reversed convention from what everyone else does for partitions. Okay, so no. McDonald's book or any, any other source on partitions, it's always decreasing. Yeah. So now this is the definition that we are taking. Okay. And so let's uh, see right here. We had an example about, let's say, a simple partition. Now for each arbitrary partition, we will define two Vronskins, and these will um, appear in all the calculations. So the first one will be denoted by H lambda. It'll be the Vronskins of classical Hermit polynomials with subscript from K1 to KL, our strictly increasing sequence. The second Vronskin will be denoted by H lambda N. It'll be the Vronskin of the same functions, but also with the Hermit polynomial of degree n. But n must be taken everywhere, but not on our strictly increasing sequence. Okay, so this is a first definition. Let's erase that. Now, before defining our polynomials, we have a, another definition. We define an Adler partition as either a double partition or a double partition preceded by a sequence of zeros of arbitrary length. But really in what follows, when I talk about an Adler partition, you can think of a double partition. We double, duplicate each terms simply. And here is the definition of our polynomials. Definition three. For an Adler partition lambda squared of length 2L, we define the X lambda Hermit family of polynomials. So here, some notations. X is for exceptional, and lambda is for the partition we are looking at. So we define this family denoted by Hn lambda. It will be our second Vronskin, but associated with an Adler partition. And n is to be taken everywhere, but not on the gap sequence. So this is the definition of our family polynomial for an arbitrary partition. And now that we have that, let's take a look at the differential operator of interest. But the exceptional limit operator is obtained to the use of state deleting Darboukram transformations and intertwining relations applied to a classical system describing uh, Hermit polynomials. Another approach is to make use of polynomial flags. But this operator is, is known. It's called, uh, denoted by T, lambda. And we see that the coefficient of this operator is written in terms of our first Vronskin. But we know from the Klein-Adler theorem that this, that this Vronskin, if it is associated with an Adler partition, it will have no zero on the real line, meaning that our differential operator will be non-singular on R, and in this context, we will call it the X Hermit operator or simply exceptional Hermit operator. And so we have a first result that we will use about this operator. The first one is uh, in proposition one. So here we say Hermit XOPs. XOPs is for exceptional orthogonal polynomials. So our Hermit XOPs are the solution, the eigenfunctions of this eigenvalue eigenfunctions problem. But this is true when the operator T is associated with an Adler partition. And this is true when N is not on the gap sequence. But we just keep in mind that we have a differential problem that has as solutions our polynomials. And here is the last definition before we go further. Um, let's consider a partition, lambda of length L, the positive integer 2M, which is defined as the sum of all the elements in our double partition. 
This is the co-dimension of our family of polynomials. But simply speaking, the co-dimension is the number of missing values in the eigenvalue spectrum of the differential operator. We'll see that in a second. And we, we precise our notation x to m lambda, meaning that exceptional of co-dimension 2m and lambda is the partition we're looking at. Now, let's take a quick look at the orthogonality relation. We will define what we, we will call here the gap sequence polynomial. P lambda will be a polynomial that has as zeros all the values of our strictly increasing sequence. And we see that if P is associated with an, a double partition and evaluated with a positive integer, then it'll be strictly positive everywhere, but not on our strictly increasing sequence. And so here is the orthogonality relation. First of all, we see that the orthogonality interval is the same as the classic orthogonality interval for Hermit polynomials. The other thing we see is that we have right here our exceptional polynomials, and here is the weight. And the weight is basically the classical weight for Hermit polynomials divided by a Vronskian. This is the first Vronskian we defined associated with an Adler partition, square. And on the right hand side, we have the norm of our exceptional polynomials. And let's imagine that we erase this expression to L and we erase our polynomial here. Well, what remains is the norm of classical Hermit polynomials. And so we have our orthogonality relation. Now from this point on, we will fix the partition to study a specific family of polynomials and try to find the general solution of the equation we will derive. So let's consider lambda equals one, like in the previous example. So this partition is a partition of m equals one. The length of the partition is one. We have our double partition and our gap sequence. So basically, we are considering the x to 1 family, co-dimension 2, partition 1. So this is a countable sequence with two missing values, n equals 1, 2. So the co-dimension is 2m equals 2. And in fact, exceptional Hermit polynomials exist only for even co-dimension. Now from the Vronskian we defined before and from the definition of our exceptional polynomials, we see that the degree of a polynomial for an arbitrary partition would be two times the sum of the elements in the partition minus two times the length of the partition plus n. But here we fixed the partition. And so we see that the degree of our fixed family reduces to n. So we are considering polynomials of degree n, which is convenient. Now, we defined earlier some Vronskians. We will calculate them for this fixed partition and associated with an Adler partition. And so our double partition here is one one. So we have the information. It's, it reduces to a polynomial of degree two. And this, the degree of this polynomial will always coincide with the co-dimension, which is two. The second one right, right here is our exceptional polynomials. We will be able to compute it explicitly when we fix n. And so here we have a, a first result that will be very useful. For the fixed partition, lambda equals one. This theorem says that our exceptional polynomials are equal to a certain function h hat up to a constant that depends on n. And h hat is defined as a linear combination of classical Hermit polynomials. 
And so this theorem tells us that we are able to express our exceptional polynomials in terms of classical Hermite polynomials. So in what follows, when we talk about H hat, well, we are talking about our exceptional polynomials. And so we will use that also. Now, since we fixed the partition, uh, we may calculate our polynomial P, which is the gap sequence polynomial. We may calculate our weight, which is the classical weight on our polynomial of degree two squared. And here is the orthogonality relation for our exceptional polynomials, but we saw that we have, let's say, a, a representation in terms of classical polynomials. So let's take a look at this one. Here we have the orthogonality relation for h hat, and we see that the norm of these polynomials is not defined when n equals one or two. And because of n, there is an order relation between the integrands of these two integrals. And so this integral will diverge if this integral diverges. So we see that this is not defined when n equals one or two. On the gap sequence, the norm is not defined. Okay. Now, let's take a look again at the first proposition. We saw right here a differential problem that has as solutions our exceptional polynomials. Let's write down this uh, relation, but with the definition of T, associated with an Adler partition. And what we obtain, what we obtain is equation 38. But this is for an arbitrary partition. Now, since, since we fixed our, our partition and after simplification, we see that our fixed polynomial is a solution of this ODE. And so we may say that HN1, our fixed polynomial, is a solution um, of equation 40, written in terms of an arbitrary function omega. But this is true when n is not on the gap sequence and when our variable is real. So let's make an extension to the missing values on the gap sequence. And let's make an extension to the complex plane. What we obtain is equation 41. We see right here the extension we made, and we will give it a name. This will be the x21 Hermit ODE, so co-dimension two, partition lambda equals one. And so this is the ODE of interest. We want to find its general solution. But we already have information about the solution. We know that h hat is a solution of this ODE, for all n that are not on the gap sequence. So what's happening on the gap sequence? We are seeking for these solutions to find a complete first particular solution. And so to address that problem, let's take a look at the definition of h hat. We have the definition of h hat. It's a linear combination of classical Hermit polynomials. And we see that when we fix n on the gap sequence, let's say n equals one or two, these subscripts will be negative. What does that mean? Okay, using that observation, we will make an extension of the parameter of classical Hermit polynomials to negative integers, n minus one, minus two, minus three, and using the classical Rodrig formula and integrating it, we will define h minus one as this function, function 43, which is written in terms of the error function. But really h minus one is not a polynomial. It is not a Hermit polynomial. But if we apply to h minus one, the classical recurrence formula for Hermit polynomials, we are able to find h minus two, h minus three, 
And substituting these functions into the definition of h hat, here is what we obtain. We obtain h hat 1 and h hat 2, which are non-polynomial functions. But when we look closer, we see that, in fact, these are non-polynomial and non-trivial solutions of our ODE on the gap sequence. And so if we consider these two functions, we can say that this is a first particular solution of our ODE, which is polynomial everywhere and non-polynomial on the gap sequence. And what we want to do is compare the solution to the potential solutions that we obtain using series representation. And so I take my ODE, I look at the initial equation. I have two roots, so two cases. The first case leads to this series. We will call it beta n. So let's forget about the finite number of terms right here. Let's focus on this sum, this series. We have an even part. We have an odd part. So this is the even coefficient, and this is the odd coefficients. And these are polynomials of n. So let's analyze the roots. The roots of the even coefficients will be called lambda p. The roots of the odd coefficient will be called lambda q. And so the first term right here, this part, generates um, roots that are on the diagonal right here as k grows. These are even positive integers. And the other part of our even coefficient, let's say for k equals 5, leads to this uh, sequence of roots, 0, 4, 6, 8. These are basically all the even positive integers, but not n equals 2, which is on the gap sequence. And we have the same phenomenon for the odd coefficients. The, the term right here generates a sequence of odd positive integers on the diagonal. And this term right here, this product, leads for k equals 5, for example, to this sequence 3, 5, 7, etc. And so these are all the odd positive integers, but not n equals 1, which is on the gap sequence. And so this analysis gives us, give us some precious information about the solution. First of all, when we fix n, the series will never be truncated because these coefficients, the odd and even coefficient, have no root in common. And so this means that when I fix n, I must have an infinite, infinite number of terms. It is non-polynomial. And so this potential solution cannot be the same as my Hermit um, exceptional polynomials. But more than that, this series gives us a mathematical expression explaining the existence of a gap in the eigenvalue spectrum of the differential operator. OK, so this is the first series. When I look at my initial equation, I have a second root, so a second case leading to this series, we will call it mu n. And so when we look at this series, we see that it is exactly the odd part of the series beta n. And so this motivates us to define a new function. We will call it mu n. Mu n will be the even part of the series beta n. And we have uh, results about these three series, beta n, mu n, mu n. Proposition three. The first series we built, beta n, is a non-polynomial solution of our ODE, the x to one Hermit ODE, for all n, even on the gap sequence. And so we have a particular solution, which is, which is valid everywhere, that do not correspond to our Hermit uh, exceptional polynomials. And proposition four tells us information about mu n and mu n. First of all, mu n is a polynomial solution of our ODE. 
when n is even and not on the gap sequence. And the other series, nu n, the odd part of beta n, is a polynomial solution when n is odd and not on the gap sequence. And so this leads to a question, do these series correspond sometimes to our exceptional Hermit uh, polynomials? Well, the answer is yes, they do. And so we have right here two theorems of correspondence about the, the, the solution that we built. So theorem three tells us that our function h hat, our exceptional polynomials, are equal to the series nu n up to a constant that depends on n. And this is true when n is odd and not on the gap sequence. And we found here an expression for the constant. And we have theorem four telling us that our exceptional polynomials are equal to the series mu n up to a constant. And this is true when n is even and not on the gap sequence. And so, in fact. So, Vincent, est-ce que je pourrais t'interrompre? Je ne me rappelle plus comment le bêta était défini ou d'où il venait quand tu l'as introduit. Peux-tu revenir à l'arrière? Avec plaisir, Donc... c'est simple, Ben. OK, ouais. mais, oui, c'est. Encore plus, plus avant, de, quel est le lien avec les, les H euh, moins 1? On va revenir ici, disons, à notre, euh, notre équation. So let's go back to our equation. Yeah. Equation 41 is, is the, the equation we are trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will use uh, the method of series, so Frobenius method or general okay. series. Okay, so beta is the solution of this equation for, for n given it, uh, as the integer. Exactly, and well, at first sight, it is a potential solution, but we verified and it is a solution. We're never 100% uh, sure that it is a solution, uh, but we must have at least one solution with the two uh, series that we built. So th that's how beta n was defined. And the h minus 1, h minus 2, are they orthogonal? Are they integrable with the measure that you've introduced? Okay, no, they are not. Uh, they diverge when you integrate them, okay, using the orthogonality relation, but these are non-polynomial solutions. So they verify the equation and they are defined with the extension we made of the parameter of um, classical Hermit polynomials. So here we defined, uh, let's erase that, we defined H minus one, and we used here Rodrigue formula with the recurrence relation, applying it to a non-polynomial function. <laughs> so this is not, um, let's say, instinctive, but it works. Okay. Um, and, uh, since I'm asking question, I'm asking another one. So if you're using your extended uh, orthogonal polynomials, so those with only uh, positive integer n with uh, that is not in the gap uh, sequence. Are these polynomial a complete set of for the measure that you've considering? Okay, so yes. Uh, to answer your question, let's go back here. Uh, right here. Okay, let's take a look at this right here. Okay. Uh, we are considering uh, this family. I would take another color right here. This is a complete orthogonal polynomial system. Even if we are missing two values, this was proved by gomez Ulate et al. Uh, and in fact, they are dense in, in the Hilbert space with respect to the measure. So these are complete, even if we are missing values. Does that so what would be the <laughs> what would be the interest of uh, creating the h minus one and h minus two in that case? Okay, it's 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 linked with the second part of the presentation because we need the general solution. Okay, go go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> and so, okay, where are we? Hey, could I just uh, intervene? Uh, so, when you say complete, you mean uh, you have a complete orthogonal system with respect to this measure but it obviously isn't all polynomials. They are polynomials. No, I'm saying it is not all the polynomials. 
I mean, the, the space of polynomials itself, Yes. Uh, let's say the Hermit, uh, what the Hermit spans, okay. is complete with respect to another measure, but, but I mean, you're missing uh, two degrees. Exactly. So in some sense, it's a smaller space, even though they're both infinite, it's a smaller space. And this is what is fascinating, in fact, with the exceptional orthogonal polynomials. This is a fascinating result that even if we are missing these values, the system is complete. Yes. But the functional space might be smaller because of the measure. What you're saying is that every normalizable function with respect to this measure can be written as at least a series in these polynomials. No, I'm not saying that. Then what do you mean by complete? Okay, uh, in the classical sense, in the classical sense, but let's go back. Just want to have time to, to go to the second part. Yes, we have 15 minutes left. So just 15 minutes left? Can, can, we, can we come back on this during the period of question, Mr. Arnab? Yes, sure. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, so let's go back right here. And so these results, so, so these results paves the way for our, let's say, main result for this part of the presentation. And so what we do right here is, Okay, we, we had two constants, okay, M1 and M2. Let's take this. And we had theorems of correspondence, seeing that the series that we built, they correspond to our exceptional orthogonal polynomials. And so we will define a new constant, M3, in terms of these constant, M1 and M2, from the previous theorems. And we will also define this constant on the gap sequence. We will define a new function, alpha n. And alpha n will basically be our exceptional polynomials. And it'll be non-polynomial when n equals one or two. And so really the constant m3 is there just to obtain normalized Vronskans in the different calculations, but it's not absol absolutely necessary. So here's a theorem, theorem five. The general solution of the exceptional Fmit differential equation, we will call it omega n. It's a linear combination of um, the functions alpha n and beta n. Uh, and these have these properties, these functions have th these properties. So alpha n not on the gap sequence correspond to the exceptional Hermit polynomials with fixed partition lambda equals one. And Alpha n on the gap sequence is defined as is defined with uh, making use of the extension of the parameter of classical Hermit polynomials, but these are non-polynomial. And beta n, they are simply non-polynomial functions. So we have a general solution. Now I had a summary with Vronskians, but let's forget about that right now. Okay, we built our general solution. Now what we want to do is uh, build a minimal surface representation. So I'll try to go fast because we don't have so much time. Uh, what we do is we make use of two important concepts. The first one is the classical nfr weierstrass formula. And the second one will be the linear system for the moving frame on the surface. But since we are talking about minimal surfaces, our mean curvature function will be zero. Uh, we will call our moving frame sigma. And sigma right here is a tree by tree matrix. Um, sigma must satisfy our gauss Garten equations. So this is the linear system that we have in 52 with potential matrices U0 and V0. So many notations, del, del bar will be holomorphic and anti-holomorphic derivatives. Uh, the Euclidean matrix on the surface here is conformal. We have u that characterizes the surface, which is a real valued function. And q right here, uh, sorry, right here, q is the, the coefficient of our up differential. But let's keep in mind that um, our gaussman garten equations are written in terms of tree by tree matrices. And on the other hand, we have the classical nfr weierstrass immersion formula written in terms of two arbitrary meromorphic functions, eta and chi. 
And so we will see in a moment that the link between the linear system for the moving frame and this uh, immersion formula is expressed in terms of as a second order linear ODE. Okay, we'll see that in a second. But we had our linear system for the moving frame in terms of three by three matrices. But if we make use of the Lie algebra isomorphism between SO3 and SU2, we may express our Van Garten equations uh, in terms of two by two matrices. So we have a new system right here. The solution right here will be in the group SU2C and we have our potential matrices. So now we have the same equations in terms of two by two matrices. The algebra right here do not correspond to the group. This is because of the parametrization we chose in terms of complex and complex conjugate variables. So we have our linear system for the moving frame and we want to reduce it. To achieve that, we will use gauge transformation. We will apply a gauge transformation M to our wave function phi. So our new wave function will be denoted by psi. Our gauge is defined right here in equation 56. It is written in terms of two arbitrary functions. And we will make the assumptions that these functions are meromorphic and that they correspond to the functions from the nfr weierstrass formula. This is an assumption we make. And doing so, we obtain a new system, which is right here, a system for a new holomorphic wave function. And so we need to focus on this equation. Our potential matrix will also be written in terms of eta and chi. And we introduced the parameter, spectral parameter lambda, which is defined as eta on its conjugate. And we make the choice to leave the parameter there. And so we have a reduced system. Let's consider the same system, but with a vector wave function having two components. So I will rewrite the same system right here, but with a new wave function psi tilde, which has as components psi one and psi two. And since this is a wave function, uh, vector wave function solution, we may express equivalently the system as this, these two ODEs. The first one is an ODE for the first component psi one, right here. And the second one, well, if I solve this equation, I know the form of psi one, so I'm able to calculate psi two. So really we focus on this equation. And this is the second order ODE I was talking about in, um, in the previous slides. This is the linear system for our, my moving frame, well, modified. Uh, okay, so we will make another assumption. Let's suppose that this equation coincides with our exceptional Hermit ODE. We found the general solution of the exceptional Hermit ODE. So let's suppose this is the same object. I can do that because we have degree of liberty with arbitrary functions in the coefficients. And so we will make an association between this equation and the exceptional Hermit ODE. This is the idea represented here. We'll suppose it, 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 these, are, these describe the same solutions. And so if they do, well, we will equate the coefficients leading to a new system that must be solved for our arbitrary meromorphic functions. So we will solve for eta, for a key, and obtain their explicit form. And so here it is. We have the explicit form of eta and key. We squared because it is, it is convenient for the calculations. And what we see is that they are expressed in terms of the orthogonality weight, which is special. Uh, and in terms of the error function. 
So now many things we can do since we know the explicit forms of eta and chi. But I will go fast. So I'm able to calculate the explicit form of my potential matrix. I'm able to calculate the explicit form of the vector wave function. We see that by hypothesis, the first component is the general solution we found in the first part of the presentation. Um, and the second one is written in terms of our general solution and its derivative. We also see that here we have the, the, the parameter lambda that parameterize our wave function. And we cannot, let's say, simplify it by a gauge. And so this leads to a one parameter family of surfaces. So we have a, a family of surfaces associated with our general solution. But more than that, we can calculate explicitly the nfr weierstrass formula. And so we have three components. Let's call them F1, F2, F3. Here is the first component of our uh, immersion formula. We see that it's written in terms of the error function, the hypergeometric function. So we still have an integral right here that we were able to reduce using integration by parts, but the result is so it's rather involved, so we, we omit it here. So this is the first component. We have our second component and our third component. So we are able to compute uh, numerical e images of these surfaces, but before doing so, we have like two last results. The first one, proposition five, is um, a quaternionic description of our surface. So nfl weierstrass formula leads to the immersion of a surface in the 3D Euclidean space. And right here we have f tilde, which is a description of the same family of surfaces, but in the SU2 algebra. And so I make the sum of the components of the nfl weierstrass formula, and I use as a basis Pauli matrices. So this is a known isomorphism. Um, that's it. And so we have a representation, a matricial representation for our family of surfaces, which is convenient for the calculations. And last result is uh, about minimal surface representation. Proposition six tells us that if you take ODE 60, the ODE 60 is Go back in it just a second. This is the ODE we're talking about in proposition six. This represents uh, our linear system for the moving frame. And so proposition six tells us that the identification of this ODE with any selected linear second order ODE leads to the explicit determination of our holomorphic functions eta and chi from the nfr weierstrass formula. And consequently, it is possible to determine an SU2 value minimal surface representation F tilde as we did right here. And these surfaces correspond to the solutions of the selected ODE, meaning that we, we, we are able to find a minimal surface representation. And so I will end right here with some uh, images. And so imagine you have a plane um, like that. And let's identify the three axes by F1, F2, F3. And so our first case for n equals zero, the surface coincides with the plane F3 equals zero. Okay, this, this is kind of a trivial case. But the other image, images we will see is for n equals to one, two, three, and seven. We have four images. What we do is we fix the integration constants, we fix the spectral parameter, and we fix the integration bounds from the nfr weierstrass uh, immersion formula. And here is what we obtain. For n equals one, n equals two, three, and seven. 
And so maybe just a quick comment about uh, these images. What we see is that there is a, a mirror symmetry with respect to the plane F2 equals C for a certain C negative. Uh, the other thing we see is that uh, the surface expands as N grows. And the last thing is that if you imagine like a butterfly having two wings right here, well, you will see the wings closing, resulting in a kind of flattening phenomenon with respect to the third component. So let's see about that. The wings are closing and the surface expands. And so these are the images I wanted to show you. Um, <clears throat> okay, I went fast on the second part. I thank you for your attention. And if you are interested in the subject, you may check uh, our last paper on the subject right here, which was just published in the uh, Anal Henri Poincaré. And if you want to check about minimal surface representation associated with classical orthogonal polynomials, have this paper right here in the uh, Journal of Nonlinear Mathematical Physics. And so, thank you. Thank you very much.